Welcome to our presentation discussing legal documents. This is our, assuming this video uh, goes correctly, this will be our final of the four uh, video series about chapter nine. Let's, let me just show you where to find those videos. We have them right now located in the online lecture module. You can see we have the passive voice lecture, the lecture on noun pronoun agreement, and the lectures on nominalization and other grammar style topics. They will also eventually all be in chapter nine. Chapter nine currently is located just below chapter three. And you can see I've already put one of the lectures here. Um, where is it? Ah uh, yes, lecture on nominalizations and other grammar style, grammar style topics. The other ones will be in the same area. There is a fifth lecture down here about emails. So um, let's get started. We're going to be doing the second half of our uh, PowerPoint lecture, basically. So let me just go ahead and pull that up. And I'm going to scroll down to about 48. So here we go. Just wait a second. Slideshow. Here we go. Okay, so we're going to be discussing in this section more the formatting of the legal documents, not so much the actual writing of each sentence in each paragraph. Um, the formatting is a pretty important topic in the law. It's never as important as the actual content, but it's a still pretty important thing that we're going to learn about. We'll see, first of all, we're going to talk about pleadings, motions, and discovery. These are things that are actually filed with the court or shared with opposing counsel. As a result, because they're going outside of that relationship between the uh, law firm and the client, we're going to be writing primarily persuasively in this context. So documents that circulate within a law firm are going to be written objectively. Documents that circulate to the client are going to be written objectively. But documents that go outside the relationship are usually going to be persuasive. And again, as we talked about before, persuasive documents have to be every bit as accurate as objective documents. Uh, objective documents aren't better. They have their own role. And persuasive documents aren't better. They have their own role. So as long as you are supposed to be writing an objective document, you write an objective document, you're doing the right thing. Um, sometimes people will start with an objective document, and then they will take that document and transform it into a persuasive document. Uh, I suppose you could do the reverse, although you, you, that would be kind of unusual. You usually start with the objective and move to the persuasive. Another important thing to think about as you're preparing these documents that are intended for use outside of your law firm is to keep in mind that there may be rules that apply that tell you how to go about formatting these documents. A formatting has to do with um, how you set up the document, what margins you have, what fonts you use, do you double space, do you single space, what margins do you have, those types of things. Let me just show, show you some examples about how that works. Um, before class began, I went ahead and pulled up some local rules. To get these local rules, all I did was Google local rules, Eastern District of Texas, and I uh, got this section, and then I went into the local rules and I picked civil rules. You can see here we've got several rules, and you can see they're numbered, but they're not numbered I mean, they're ordered, numbered in order, but there are some gaps. And that's because uh, they're based upon the federal rules of civil procedure. But there is no local rule on federal rules of civil procedure 2, so there is no local rule 2. And you can see down here, there's actually two local rules relating to federal rules of civil procedure 5. Uh, so let's just look at, we'll say, uh, local rule 4. Um, and this explains um, how you go about filing uh, uh, various documents. Let me see. Let's look at Local Rule 5. America. 
This explains how you indicate electronic signatures, for example. And some of these things are going to vary from, um, you know, one jurisdiction to another. That's why we, what we care about making sure that we have um, the right local rules and that we're following them. And it's very common for law firms for uh, you to be dealing with more than one. Let's look at form of pleading. So we're looking at local rule 10. Um, so you might be practicing in the Northern District of Texas and the Eastern District of Texas, and there may be some technical rules that are different. So when you're thinking about the way the documents ought to be formatted, you may be thinking, well, should I single space it? Should I double space it? Should I use legal size paper or letter size paper? What kind of margin should I have? What kind of font should I have? Well, let's see what the rules are. So we see here that they need to be typed. They need to be double spaced. They need to be on a non-legal size paper, and they need to be white paper. And the, the font needs to be no smaller than 12 point type. So these are the rules about the forms of pleadings. And we can see here rule four is about the summons. We go over here to our uh, federal rules. We scroll down till we get to the rules. There's actually quite a bit of stuff in front of it. Here we go, and here we go. And you can see rule four is about summons. Let's scroll down and see what rule 10 is about. Rule 10, form of pleadings. And you'll see here, this doesn't say anything about the size of the font or the size of the paper, because local courts can decide, no, we want legal size paper, we want letter size paper, we want double space, we want single space, we want this size font or that size font. So there's gonna be variations, and that's why you need to look up the local rules when you're formatting your documents. And so that's an important step whenever you are preparing documents that are going to be filed in court. Um, there's really kind of two sets of local rules. One are the official rules that are published that I just showed you. Um, obviously, you're going to have to follow those. But a second set of rules, and I guess they're not so much rules as practices, and that is um, different courts have different typical ways the documents look. Not 100% of the filings in any court are going to be the same in terms of format, but you'll see there's definitely a trend where most of the documents, probably 80%, are going to look pretty darn similar. You want your documents to be 90%. You want your documents to blend in in terms of formatting. Obviously, you want your content to stand out because it's so amazing, but the format is not the place you want to stand out. When you have significantly different format, what people assume is one of two things. Either this is a law firm that doesn't care about creating beautiful documents and therefore is probably kind of a, a sloppy and, and not very professional law firm. That's one possibility, obviously not positive. The second is, oh, this is a law firm that primarily practices elsewhere. Um, that's not as negative, but it's still kind of negative because uh, it's a little bit like a football team. Uh, you don't want the hometown refs to be uh, thinking that you're the outsider. Uh, you want to, to be as appear as much like somebody who knows the ins and outs of how things are done here as you can. And so that's why it's helpful to look at recent filings in that court by some of the major law firms in that area and use those uh, uh, patterns to kind of get you set up so your documents look like what the court is used to seeing. 
So we're going to talk about the letter. The letter is probably the most common document that a law firm creates. Uh, nowadays, many businesses have gone to using email a lot. Um, and email is great, and law firms definitely use email. They use it at an increasing amount. But the letter is still kind of the heart of the communication. In fact, uh, many times what email is used for is to send a scanned letter. So even with email, we, we oftentimes fall into the, the pattern of using letters. So I'm going to discuss with you the nuts and bolts of letters. Now, what I'm about to show to you, if you have been uh, working in a business office where you produce letters pretty regularly, you're gonna be like, oh, that letter's not any different than a normal business letter. You're right, it probably isn't. There really aren't particular things in a legal letter that are different than a normal business letter. Maybe a little bit more formal, and people might be a bit more formal or picky about you following the rules. So we're going to go through those things kind of in detail. And these are the, the highlights. We're going to talk about where you put the date and how you format the date, how you describe the method of delivery and the address block. Another name for the address block is the inside address. We're going to talk about the reference line, oftentimes called the ray line or the subject line, and also the salutation or the greeting. We'll talk about the body of the um, letter and also the closing. Uh, was it just sometimes called the valediction? So let's look at, at an example of a legal letter. Now, one thing you'll notice about this letter is that virtually everything in this letter is on the left margin. That's what we call a block letter format. Many law firms use block letter format. It's probably not the most common format, but it isn't rare. If your law firm uses a block format, it's a pretty easy letter to format. Uh, that's why people use it. Uh, law firms that don't use block format per oftentimes prefer a little bit more formal or maybe a little bit more elegant style of doing a letter. And um, so each law firm kind of has its own thing. Most law firms of, of any significant size will have a particular way that everything is done in terms of writing a letter. And so there won't be a lot of, of gray area where you can say, oh, well, I, today I'd like to do it this way. Well, no, we always do it this way. Um, if it's a very small law firm, though, they may not have established that pattern, and you might be the one who gets to do that. And so I'm going to show you some things to think about when you're thinking about formatting the letter. Let's first of all start by looking at the top of the letter. This is what's called the letterhead. In law firms that have been around really any length of time at all, this is going to be printed already. And so when you actually print your letter, you will put the letter, the, the page with letterhead into your printer uh, so that this stuff can print because the letterhead's already typeset on there. Only the first letter of a letter gets the letter hat. And you can see it's it's kind of a marketing thing with the law firm. It's going to include the name of the law firm, its physical address, a telephone number, fax, email. Um, it may include um, name partners and other kinds of information. There may be some logos or other things. Again, it's designed to be a marketing tool for the law firm. Law firms that are just starting out or perhaps physically move locations may for a period of time not have a printed letterhead and so you may actually have a macro that you put on your Word documents that you insert the um, uh, letterhead. That's obviously not quite as professional looking but still I mean it, it, it does its job uh, during, during that period of time of transition. So we do the letterhead first, and then under the letterhead, the very next thing that's going to appear is going to be the date, and it's going to be put in the traditional American format, which means you spell out the entire month. Obviously, June's not a good example because no one abbreviates that, but if it were October, we'd write out the whole word October. Then we do a space and then we would write the digit. We wouldn't do um, ordinal numbers. We would do just the, the one digit. One, two, three, four. We wouldn't do first, second, third, fourth. Um, and we don't, if it's a one through nine, it would only be one digit. Then obviously if it's 10 through 31, it would be two digits. We do a comma space and we do the four digits of the year. 
That's the formatting for the date. Then below the date, we're going to have the method of delivery. Most letters include a method of delivery. If you are doing first class US mail, you don't have to include method of delivery. That's the assumed method of delivery unless you specify otherwise. Having said that, there's lots of letters that um, still say the method of delivering when it's first class US mail. Uh, but in my experience, at least most law firms don't send a lot of stuff through first class US mails unless they're, you know, your typical bills like rent and telephone bill. And, and uh, you know, when they're in the role of an attorney, then they're not going to typically be using US mail. They want to have a more uh, secure, certain means of delivery. So a lot of times they use certified mail return receipt requested, or they use FedEx or UPS. Those are the more common methods. And if you're using one of those, then you're going to specify the delivery. Oftentimes if there's a tracking number that's associated with the method of delivery, that is also included on this line. Uh, your method of delivery can be underlined, it can be italics, it can be bold, it can be more of one of those things than another. Um, so uh, you have some flexibility at that. I think most people kind of do jazz up their method of delivery. I don't know why um, people aren't going to jazz up the date or the inside address, but this one and, and the ray line oftentimes gets a little bit of a drama associated with it. You don't have to do that though if you don't want to. The next section is the bl address block or at least people from my generation will know it as the inside address. Um, I'm not quite sure why it's called that, I guess, because it's inside the letter. It's the same address that goes on the outside of the envelope in many cases, although sometimes certain details are removed. So what you want here is you want the name of the person to whom you are sending it, you want the name of the firm, and then you want the street address and then the city, comma, state, and then the uh, zip code. You'll notice at the end of each one of these lines, there are no commas. If you were to have this uh, complete address on one continuous line, you'd put a comma after Esquire and a comma after the business name and a comma after the E period. But when you stack them this way, the, the fact that it's on a different line kind of serves the purpose of the comma. So be sure to remove those commas. Let's say I wanted to include John Francis Doyle Jr. Esquire's title. Let's say his title is Senior Director. Well, typically I would put that on the next line between his name and the name of the uh, company. Sometimes people put it on the same line as his name. If I do that, I am going to put a comma here after Esquire and put the name right here. If I don't, then I'm not going to have a comma there. Um, it's common or it's preferred to put a Mr. in front, in this case, because obviously he's a fella, to put a Mr. in front of his name. Um, we do that uh, following this logic. Uh, and, and this is kind of a, a governing principle when we prepare legal documents. It's a good idea if you don't go into the law. And that is our goal when we write a letter to somebody is to work hard not to offend. Our goal is to avoid, you know, if, if there's two ways of doing it, we stop and think, well, what's the one that's least likely to offend? Um, and in this case, putting a mister in front is, lot, is a little bit more gracious than not putting Mr. in front. I mean, is he going to become irate if you don't put Mr. in front of his name? No, but it may not impress him. But if you put Mr. John Francis Doyle Jr., I mean, you're not going to offend him unless he happens, you know, I, that name is so male. I couldn't believe a woman would have that name, but if it were, say, Pat Doyle, and you assume it's a man and actually is a woman, you put Mr., well, that, that could be a problem. That could offend somebody. But in this case, when you know the person is male, go ahead and put Mr. in front here. We wouldn't write out the word Mr. We do capital M, lowercase r, period. And obviously, if this were Jane Doyle, then we would do Ms., capital M, lowercase s, and period. If John Francis Doyle Jr. were a doctor, either a PhD type doctor or a medical doctor, we would do capital D R period. If John Francis Doyle were a, a court clerk or a judge, we would do honorable, capital H O N period. Those are all of the um, abbreviations, the honorifics that go in front of names. Sometimes people ask, well, what about if Jane Doyle is married? Do I do MRS, period? No, 
Um, the only time that we would do that is if we have a reason to believe, a pretty clear reason to believe that um, Jane Doyle would prefer MRS period. The assumption in business communication is that a person, whether they're married or single, uh, would prefer MS period if he or she, or I guess if she is a woman. Um, if though, if you have some reason to think that she would prefer Miss, M-I-S-S, or Mrs, M-R-S, period, then of course use that. But if you don't have a reason to, to think there's a preference, then go with M-S, period. Let's go to the ray line or the reference line. This line is intended to convey information to the reader to help him or her decide what he's about to learn. It's almost like the title of a book. You know, you, when you are looking to read a book, uh, it's helpful to know what the book is about and you look to the title to kind of get that first bit of information. Well, that's what the reference line is going to give. Sometimes it helps the reader kind of prepare his mind so he knows, oh, okay, it's about that matter. Maybe he even gets out the file and looks it over before he really dives into the letter. It also helps him prioritize things. If it's something like, you know, birthday wishes or something. He might think to himself, oh, today's a busy day. That's wonderful. I got a birthday card, but I don't need to read it right now. Um, and so it can help him prioritize matters. A good ray line is going to have two ingredients. It's going to describe the client matter information. And it's so that's the first thing it's going to do. And this letter does that very well. You're going to know what the matter is because you have the style or the, the name of the lawsuit. And you also have the civil action. This is the, 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 uh, the number, the, the case number that is filed with the clerk. It would even be better, though, if um, this uh, letter included the file number for this particular law firm for this particular matter. And even nicer than that would be to include uh, John Francis Doyle's file number. My guess is he's opposing counsel. And so his file number is going to be different than obviously our file number because his system will be different. And so you can include our file number, blah, 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 and your file number, blah, blah, blah. And of course, the only way you'd have that number is if you see, you've received other correspondence from him. That's a really nice touch. Not necessary. This is adequate, but um, those are just some nice touches if you want to go above and beyond. So we've accomplished one of our goals, but this reference line fails at the other goal, which is to tell the reader what the topic of this particular um, uh, presentation, or the, not presentation, letter is going to be about. I mean, it's not going to be about the whole case. It's going to be about a particular issue, such as uh, when can we schedule Larry's deposition, or we have a settlement offer to suggest, or um, uh, we're going to be following this motion. Do you oppose it? Something like that. And so you give that subject. And typically you list the discrete subject first, and then below that you list the file information. It's very common for a reference line to be uh, two, three, four, even five lines long. It can be as short as one, certainly, but um, it's not uncommon at all for it to be several lines long. And one of the things that all that information helps is it helps the person who's responsible for filing the letter. Maybe it's you, which so of course you want to help yourself, but maybe it's the file clerk. And, uh, you know, obviously you want to be nice to that person because they're a colleague of yours, but also you want to make it easy for them because if it's easy, it's less likely they'll misfile the document. And if it's misfiled, it may be very, very difficult to find. Nowadays, many law firms have electronic filing systems in addition to the paper filing system. So it's probably not quite as serious because you're probably going to be electronically filing it on your own. Um, but still, it can be, you know, a hassle to track down that letter to find it. And so anything you can do to help that process along is going to ultimately pay you dividends. Let's look at the next section, which is the salutation or the greeting. It's always going to start with dear. We're not saying here that Mr. Doyle is our best friend. If you go ahead and read the letter, you see they're not best friends at all. It's a pretty stern letter. We always start with it. It doesn't mean Mr. Doyle is our friend. And we're going to start with a capital D. Then we're going to have a space. Then we're going to go Mr. and his last name. We're not going to include John, Mr. John Doyle. That's not, um, we, we use the, the honorific and then we use the surname. Or it could have been Ms. Doyle if it happens to be a woman. Um, sometimes people say, well, why can't I say dear John or dear Jane or whatever the person's name is? That's fine if you have a, a pretty uh, uh, 
friendly and established relationship with them, uh, it, th that is very acceptable to do. Um, in this case, it's a pretty uh, stern letter that's being sent, so that might have been the reason that Alan chose to go with Mr. Doyle to kind of communicate some of that formality. Um, it could also be that he doesn't know Mr. Doyle very well. If you're going to err on the side, err on the side of more formality, especially when you're dealing with your clients. Um, they're paying a lot of money for your services, so being very polite to them is not a bad idea. Um, you might be in a situation occasionally where you're not sure what a person's gender is. Maybe the name is Pat Doyle and you haven't ever met Pat. Or maybe the name's from a different culture and you're not familiar with what that name means in that culture. So you don't know if this is a man or woman. Less than an ideal situation. One way to, to resolve it is to do a little bit of discreet detective work. But if that doesn't work, if you can't ask around discreetly, um, then it's best to just leave it without any um, honorific in front of it. So this would be right. Obviously John Francis is not an ambiguous name, but if it were again Pat Doyle, you don't know if it's Patricia or Patrick. And so leaving it Pat Doyle is better than guessing and guessing wrong. And here what I would recommend you do is if you know, obviously you don't know Pat since so you don't know Pat's gender, so I'd probably go with Dear Pat Doyle. Uh, do the whole name. Again, not very elegant, not not the best choice, but better than misgendering somebody. That's something that might well offend somebody. At the end of the salutation, we use a colon. Colon is for business communications. We use commas for personal communication. So a letter to your great, great aunt Mabel, you're going to use a comma. Letter to your client, you're going to use a colon. Anytime you use letterhead, you're going to use a colon. When you use your personal stationery, um, it's going to be a combination of colons and commas. For example, if you're sending out your uh, if you're sending out uh, your resume, then you're going to use a colon. If you're sending a thank you letter for that beautiful Christmas present you got, you're going to use a comma, um, unless maybe it's from a business colleague, and you still probably would use a comma under those circumstances. Uh, so those are the formatting things for the salutation. Now we're to the body of the letter. Obviously, this is the main event. This is where you're going to be spending most of your time. But for our purposes today, since we're just talking about the format, we're going to skip over this quickly. Um, the, rule, the rule about bodies of letter are this. You need to have at least two paragraphs in every letter. And every paragraph has to have at least two sentences, except the last paragraph can have just one sentence. So you need to have an absolute minimum of three sentences. Two sentences for the first paragraph, one sentence for the second paragraph. Obviously you can have a lot longer letter, but that's the bare minimum. So that's the body of the letter. And then we're going to have your closing, which is also called the valediction. And really there's two closings to consider using here. One is very truly yours and one is sincerely. If you're in a, again, your law firm's going to have a practice in Syria, so use whatever your law firm tells you to. But if your law firm doesn't have a, a tradition in this area, I would encourage you to use very truly yours. It's the classic way of closing a letter, and it does communicate that, that level of formality. But if you prefer sincerely, that's also very acceptable. So, how do you format very truly yours? Where are you going to capitalize the V? But you're not going to capitalize the T, and you're not going to capitalize the Y. And you're going to have a comma here. You have a comma here whether it's personal cor correspondence or business correspondence. Sincerely is even easier. You capitalize the S in sincerely and you end it with a comma. Since it's just one word, you don't have to remember that you're not going to capitalize <clears throat> second and third words. Then you're going to leave a space here. You're going to want at least three spaces. Uh, for somebody who's a big signer, you may need four or even five spaces. You're only going to want to get down to two in kind of dire circumstances where you're really trying hard to squeeze it all onto one page and you've, you've gotten rid of all the extra spaces and still you just can't get to three spaces without it going over into the second page. In this case, you could get rid of an extra space here. You could get rid of an extra space here. Um, there's some, uh, you could probably uh, figure out a way to, to get one of the, you know, you know, cut a couple words here and get this one more line set up. So um, there's some fat in terms of spacing here. Um, but if you get rid of all the fat and the only way to keep it on one page is to get down to two and you have a signer that's willing to work with you, you could do that. 
but that's really just kind of a worst case scenario. You don't want to do that regularly. And again, so I, I consider a three the usual minimum. Below the signature place, you're going to have the name typed out. In this case, Alan P. Gilmore. You'll, you'll do whatever that person likes. Now, many times people like to sign. He might go by Al, for example. And so he might sign his name Al Gilmore. But he may w very well prefer to have his legal formal name written here. Um, again, people vary about what they want to do with that. So if you're preparing a letter for someone else, it's a good practice to know um, you know what what his or her preferences might be. Now because this is on law firm letterhead the assumption is whoever signs a letter coming from the law firm is an attorney unless it specifies underneath the name some other position. So it's not necessary in this case since Alan's an attorney to actually put attorney at law underneath the name. There's nothing wrong with it but it's not a requirement. Um, if you, if Alan P. Gilmore was a paralegal though, it would be necessary that we have paralegal or legal assistant or something underneath the name. You'll see that because the title goes below his name, there is no comma after Gilmore. If for some reason we decided to put attorney at law on the same line as Alan P. Gilmore, we'd put a comma and then put this information. But that's not as attractive and so I don't, re I don't recommend that you do that. Now we're going to go to typist initials. Oh, one more thing to say is there is no line for a signature in a letter. We don't do that for a letter. Now, when we get to pleadings, which we're not going to do in this case, in this course, uh, you, you'll see that there will be differences. The closing is called respectfully submitted. We don't use that in a letter. And you'll also know, no, notice that there is a line to sign on. You don't have to worry about that here. You'll learn about those particular documents in civil litigation and you'll also learn about them in advanced legal documents preparation. But for here we're just focusing on the letter and we're also going to do a little bit on the legal memorandum. Okay, so let's talk about typist initials. The purpose of typist initials is to create a paper trail of who signed the letter and who uh, prepared the letter. So if there's a typo in it, we know who to blame. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. That's the real reason behind this. And so if Alan P. Gilmore types his own letter, we're not going to use typist initials. It would be silly to say APG backslash APG. So we're just not going to do that. The assumption with there are no typist initials is that he wrote the letter, typed it, and signed it himself. So this suggests that somebody else typed the letter. Now we'll say her name is Ellen Cummings. Um, Ellen may have written the letter. She may have written the letter and typed the letter. She may have only typed the letter. Maybe Alan actually wrote the letter. Um, so this role can vary somewhat. Uh, the way that we set it up is the first initials are the signer. So this is, we're going to be able to see that very clearly here in the signature block. And we capitalize those. Then we do a backslash and we in a lowercase put the typist initials. So if you type your own documents, which very likely you'll do, I mean most attorneys and paralegals type, I mean it varies, but, but uh, certainly by the end of my practice I was typing most of my documents. When I started my practice I was typing 0%. When I ended my practice I was probably typing 80% of my, my documents. And let's talk about CCs. So what does it mean when we have a CC here? Well it means that while the letter is addressed to John, in addition to John's copy, Danforth will be getting a copy and Charlotte will be getting a copy. John will see that Danforth is getting a copy and John will see that Charlotte is getting a copy. Danforth will see that the letter was really addressed to John and Danforth will also see that Charlotte's getting a copy. Charlotte will see that it's really addressed to John and that Danforth is are, are also getting a copy. So there's complete transparency. The three people know all about each other. That's the CC. Um, you can see in this case probably Charlotte is the client because I can see her name is appearing in the style of the case. Some law firms choose not to put their client's name in the CC but instead prefer to do a BCC and you can even BCC other people in the firm. So how do you go about doing that? Well a BCC is um, 
what's abbreviation for blind carbon copy or blind courtesy copy. So let's imagine that instead of a CC for Charlotte, we have a BCC. I mean, literally you write it BCC uh, colon. Well, in that case, probably the BCC would be on a separate page, so a page two. And in that case, John would see that Danforth is getting a copy of the letter. And Danforth would see that John was getting a copy of the letter. But neither John nor Danforth would be able to see that Charlotte is getting a copy of the letter. Charlotte would be able to see that both John and Danforth are getting a letter. So it's a way to be uh, more discreet about uh, some communications, uh, in this case to the client or to somebody else maybe to an expert witness who's um, been hired to handle the case. There can be lots of reasons why you do BCCs. So that's the structure. And I said at the beginning, this is set up in block letter format because everything you can see here is right here on the left margin. But I also said there's another way of formatting letters, which is called modified block. Now I say there's, I'm acting like there's just one version of modified block. There's lots of versions of it. I'm going to tell you about the way that I format letters because this is the way that I learned at my first law firm. And so you may um, go to a law firm and they may call their style of letter modified block format, but they may do it somewhat differently. And that's perfectly fine. You know, it's the, the important thing is that you learn whatever that method is and you do it. So the way that I do letters is that up here the date, and everything is in the same order. The only thing we're talking about is kind of how we're formatting it on the line um, horizontally. Everything vertically is the same. So the date is going to be tabbed over to the approximate center. You don't center the date, you tab it over. And you'll see why in a minute. Then the method of delivery, this, these, all of these are left justified, meaning that they begin on the left margin. What we do is we flip this around and make it right justified so that the end of this is sitting right here on this margin. Uh, the, the address block or the inside address is going to be exactly where it is here. The ray line is going to be indented one tap. Dear Mr. Doyle is going to be exactly where it is. And the body of the letter is also going to be on the left margin, except the first line is going to be tabbed one over. And so that will be true for the word, the word after will be indented a little bit. So will the word should. Very truly yours is going to be tabbed over. So the V here lines up vertically with the J. So if the J is right here, the V is going to be right here. And then directly below that, we'll have the A in Allen and the A in Attorney at Law. If we center these rows, they wouldn't all line up vertically in that nice way because some of the, you know, this line, you know, Allen P. Gilmore is slightly shorter than very truly yours, comma. So it wouldn't line up and it, it would look, it would look strange. <laughs> the bottom line is. And these stay right here on this margin. So that gives you an overview. You're not responsible for knowing. Um, how I happen to set up a modified block letter. You'll learn about that in advanced legal documents prep, which is kind of a preview of coming attractions. What I want you to know is what these various parts are and um, uh, why we have them in the letter and what kind of information is in them. So I'm not going to ask you, you know, do you center the date or do you put it on the left margin? That's not a question because, uh, as I said before, you'd have to know what your law firm is doing. But I might ask you, why do we date letters or do we always date letters? And let me talk a little bit about that. You know, writing a letter is not a tremendously short process. You have to write it, you have to rewrite it, you have to, you know, think a pretty hard bit of time about it. You know, it's hard to get a letter done in less than 30 minutes and that's a pretty darn short letter. Um, and so you've invested a fair amount of time on it. So you had a motivation for the letter. You were thinking, I need to do this letter. Well, if you need to do the letter, you need to have a date on the letter. Uh, because probably you were sending the letter, at least in part, to create a paper trail to show, yes, I did a certain thing. And, and part of that is going to be by a certain time because you want to be able to show how this letter fit in into a sequence of events. You know, it may be important that it happened before that next thing or after the thing that it was uh, directly before, or that you sent the letter out only three days after blank happening, or you sent the letter out two days before that deadline. And so, yes, we do date all letters. 
And so you also want to know what the, the ray line is for. And I told you, you know, the two functions with that. So those are the important things to keep in mind with the letter. Don't get caught up in the details of how we set up the typist initials. Just know the reason that we have typist initials and what the typist initials are, for example. Let's go to the next slide. So we're going to talk about four letters. We've talked about the format of the letters, but what we really haven't talked about is what, what you say in the letter. And obviously that's the most important part. So uh, the textbook has identified four common letters that legal professionals prepare. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of those letters. So the first one is the informative letter. And guess what? It's exactly what you think it is. It's giving information, oftentimes to the client, but sometimes to other people. And now obviously this letter can be very short. Maybe you're just telling the client about a particular, hey, we have a hearing on this date, please come. It may just be as, you know, three sentences like we talked about before. Um, or it could be a very complicated situation where you want to put in great detail uh, some information. It might take more than one page. Um, so uh, that's a very common letter for a uh, paralegal to prepare. And again, you would use the same format, whichever, for, whichever particular type of letter you're writing. The next type of letter is a confirmation letter. You've had an oral discussion perhaps with opposing counsel or perhaps with your client, and now you are wanting to memorialize that letter. Maybe you were talking with opposing counsel about when to schedule Bob Smith's deposition. Y'all have decided to have it on April 17th, and um, it's going to be at 10 o'clock, and it's going to be at your law office. Um, well, you, then you would include that information in the confirmation letter and send it to opposing counsel. Uh, thank you, and you might have your by letter read like this. Thank you for speaking with me today about scheduling Bob Smith's deposition. As you know, we have scheduled it for blah, blah, blah time, blah, blah, blah date, blah, blah, blah address. If you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. And what this does is, is in the event that the attorney forgot to calendar the date or miscalendared the date, you will have a documentation that you sent him the information. If you don't have it in writing, he can say all day, well, they told me the wrong date. And you can't really disprove that unless you have that letter. And so it's a way to avoid uh, miscommunications. And, you know, honestly, sometimes people aren't completely honest and so uh, they may not genuinely be confused but they're playing some game with you so having that co confirming letter is going to remove their ability to play that game. You might think when you hear about this you might think oh well, that's kind of rude to send that letter. You're basically questioning their integrity. Um, it may sound like that a little bit but they're routinely sent and they're not perceived in that way. Now when you send the letter to the client you may want to be especially careful especially if the client isn't a legal professional so it doesn't seem like you think they're an idiot and they can't show up when they've agreed. Um, but um, uh, that that's what the the confirming letter is. This is something that you might think about doing by email if the practice in your law firm is to do it that way because it would be probably a shorter process. I'm going to skip opinion letters and go back and go on to demand letters. Uh, the, the first two, by the way, of these, these tools are very commonly done by paralegals. It's, it's not unusual at all for paralegals to write the letters and even to send them out under their own signature. The next document we go to would be a common one for a paralegal to prepare, though he or she's probably not signing the letter. Probably the attorney is going to sign the letter. A demand letter is kind of also what it sounds like. It is when you, usually the plaintiff or the potential plaintiff, is contacting the potential defendant and telling them, pay me this money or do whatever, you know, the, 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 the solution in your opinion is, or I'm going to sue you. And so it's a, it's a threat. I mean, it's not a bad threat like, you know, I'm going to break your kneecaps. It's a, I'm going to see you type threat. And so um, typically in this letter, these letters can be as short as one page, but I would say are usually probably two pages. In this letter, you're going to uh, describe the allegations uh, to some extent. Uh, that's kind of a judgment call as to how detailed to get. Maybe cite a relevant statute or case. 
discuss your damages, you know, maybe even provide copies of, of uh, medical records or other receipts, and then um, explain what you're going to do if they decide not to pay you what you think you are owed, and give them a deadline. I've got to know one way or the other by this particular date. And you want the attorney to sign it. Obviously, the purpose of this letter is to be kind of intimidating. And getting a letter from an attorney is a little bit more intimidating than getting a letter from a paralegal. So that's why the attorney is going to sign the letter. Now, there are kind of two categories of demand letters. One are demand letters that um, are sent because a particular statute requires that the demand letter be sent. These um, statutes usually say before you can file your lawsuit, you have to let the other guy know that you have this issue and you, want, you have to give them an opportunity to settle the matter. And so in that case, if it's a statutorily required demand letter, you want to be sure you know what the statute requires. It's not unusual for the statute to require that you give them a certain number of days to investigate the matter, oftentimes 30 days. So if you're planning on giving just 15, the statute says 30, you got to give 30. Another thing that sometimes the demand letter requires is that you actually mention the statute or even um, include a portion of the statute. And so just be sure that you know all the ins and outs of that particular demand letter requirement. Um, I would say that most demand letters though are sent not because of a statutory requirement, but just because it's perceived that this is a good way of perhaps resolving the complaint without the necessity of filing a lawsuit. And so it, it is a, a negotiation tool from that perspective and sometimes it can be effective. Let me go back to our fourth item, the opinion letter. The opinion letter paralegals sometimes are involved in doing the research for and maybe even making initial drafts on sections, but most likely the attorney will be involved in, uh, significantly involved in the drafting of the letter and he or she will certainly sign the letter. Opinion letter is again just kind of what it sounds like. The client has asked for a written opinion, in other words legal advice on a particular issue. Um, usually legal advice that a, a, a law firm gives to a client is done orally, uh, verbally, instead of in writing. Um, but in this case, the client wants it in writing. Very likely the client is intending to use that letter either um, to uh, maybe to provide some evidence of kind of that it's acting in good faith to an insurance company or um, uh, it, it is between perhaps a rock and a hard place legally. It has two courses of action, both of which have legal risk associated with it. Under those circumstances, it may want to get some legal advice so that when it follows that advice, it can at least say, look, I mean, maybe I messed up, but I did the best I could. I asked an attorney and I did what he said. Um, and so it re reduces the likelihood of maybe some kind of punitive fines or things along those lines. Uh, the issue of opinion letters is a really complex uh, topic, but kind of beyond the scope of this particular class. So um, we'll move on from there. And uh, now we're going to talk about the other document uh, that's kind of on board for us this time, and that's the legal memorandum. If you were to ask a hundred legal professionals, what's the the classic legal document. I think many of them, most of them would say the legal memorandum. And um, so that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time with. You're going to actually be writing one of these when you get to legal writing, but we're not going to write one of these yet um, in, this, in this program. Um, let me pause and make a distinction between a legal memorandum and an office memorandum. Law firms use both. An office memorandum, of course, any business does. This is just a memo that goes around. Maybe it's a memo that says, um, you can, you know, take a half day on Christmas Eve, or maybe it's a memo saying, hey, I can't locate file XYZ. Does anyone have it in their office? That type of thing. Those types of file, uh, those types of memos go around law firms all the time. That's not a legal memorandum. That's just your usual memorandum. Um, but a legal memorandum is going to be one in which you're communicating legal advice. You've done some legal research and you've distilled it into some advice. This is going to be for internal use within the law firm. It may ultimately be shared with the client, but especially if you've developed the legal research, it's going to be changed before it goes out to the, uh, to the client. 
It's going to involve objective writing and careful objective writing. You're not taking a position here. You're just presenting the facts. It may be that you've got bad news for the client. The client wants to do X and you've researched and found out, oops, there's some problems with that. Best that the client know now. So be honest, be, I mean, be diplomatic, but be direct about communicating these are the dangers with this course of action. Obviously, if the research that you develop is ultimately used in a brief that's filed with the court, it's going to have to be significantly rewritten to be persuasive in that case, which is fine. But this document should always be objective. So let's look at the, the, the various parts of it. We're going to have a heading. We're going to have a statement of the facts of the case. We're going to have questions presented. Um, what I called brief answers. Um, I think they have a different name for it in the textbook. Then we have a discussion section, which is really the heart and soul of the memo. And then finally a conclusion. So let's go to the next slide here. Okay, so here we have the heading and you can see we have the date in standard form. And most of the time when I've seen headings, this date is actually, let me go ahead and get a marker going here, is actually put down here. Um, it's not a big deal where you put it. Your law firm's probably going to have a set way of doing it. You're going to have to, the, it's going to be sent to the attorney. And then if you're preparing and if you're Elena, then you're going to need to have your title paralegal. If you don't have a, a designation that shows you're not an attorney, the assumption will be you are an attorney. And keep in mind that you may move on to bigger and better things and someone may reference this email 10 years from now and not know who you are. Again, if you haven't designated yourself as a paralegal, they may mistakenly think you're an attorney. Then we have the race section. This race section has the same type of problems that we had with our letter. It does a really good job of defining the file information, but it doesn't really well tell you what the topic of the email, I mean, the memorandum is about. We get a hint with the word emotional distress, but it would have been better to say, Ray, the emotional distress claims of Rachel and Melanie Neely, and then have the file information. So this isn't maybe the best ray line, but not terrible either. So we have the statement of facts is going to be our next section usually. Some law firms put it after um, after the questions and answers. So that's a possible place, but the more common place is here. So I'm not even going to mark that. I'm going to, because that's maybe going to mislead you. I've seen it put there, but the way I'm used to it is having the statement of facts right at the top. You really only want to use facts that are relevant to the particular issues of the case that are that are raised in your memo. Your memo is not going to cover every single issue in the case. Most cases have dozens of issues. And so you may just be using 5% of the facts as you're talking about the case. You may spend a little bit of time, maybe one paragraph in your facts, giving an overview of the case if the reader isn't that familiar with the case. But then you're going to focus on just the facts that are relevant to the issue that you're exploring. And you're going to present the facts chronologically, which means you're going to start from the most distant in time to the most recent. So recent is going to be down here. And this is true even if there are relatively unimportant facts, relatively boring facts up here, you might like to get to the juicy facts that might be down here. But no, we're going to do these in chronological order. The reason for that is our brains like things in chronological order. If we mix things up and put things out of chronological order, a, a not so careful reader will in his mind or her mind reconstruct the events so that your crazy order is the order that they think actually things happened. And so they may be thoroughly confused about what happened. So just always stick with chronological order. Another thing to remember is you want to present your facts objectively and relatively dispassionately. I mean, you don't want to offend anybody, but um, this isn't your, your time to kind of hide or be really, really vague or unclear about bad facts for you. Just spell them out. Then you're going to have a section where you're going to present your questions presented. Let, uh, let me just go ahead and show you where the facts section is here. This is the facts. My comment about this is that it's way too long. I mean, I'm not going to say there's never a um, legal memorandum that needs this many facts, but most of the time you're going to have two, 
maybe three paragraphs, I guess four in a really complex manner. This seems rather excessive to me. The next section is going to be your uh, questions presented and you're going to format them just as they are here with a real question mark. They're going to be a real question um, and, and I'm going to read when I say a real question, I mean it in both senses. They're going to be formatted as a question. When you read it, it sounds like a question. And then it's going to be a sincere question. When you read the question, you're going to think to yourself, hmm, yeah, I don't know what the answer is. Hmm, I'm interested to find out. At least that's the hope when you read the question format. Let's look at these two examples to get a flavor for how question formats go. Does Neely have a claim for negligent infliction of emotional distress as a result of viewing the injury sustained by her daughter in a car accident caused by Thompson's negligence? This is a really good question presented. You get a flavor about what happened. You can imagine, okay, yeah, somebody would be upset to see their child being injured in a car accident. And you can see if, if Thompson caused the car accident that he might be responsible for the fact that the mom is pretty darn upset about seeing this. So you have a pretty a very brief but clear summary of the most important facts of the case and you understand why this is an issue. This is a really good question. Next one not so much. Does Melanie have a claim for the intentional infliction of emotional distress arising out of Thompson's statements to her on April 2, 2011? Well, you don't know, but just by reading the statement, what Thompson said to her, we can go back to the facts and see. Um, here's something about mother's bad behavior. Mother is a selfish woman. Uh, mother would leave Melanie once the right man came along. Uh, those are pretty ugly things Thompson was saying to Melanie. Uh, but you don't get the flavor of that here. I mean, Thompson might have been saying to Melanie, um, I like your hat, you know, or who, who knows what. So you, you have to look elsewhere for this question to really make sense. And that's what you don't want in a questions presented. So this is a good one. This is a, and it's not the worst one I've ever read, but it's not nearly as good. I'm going to say maybe okay. And you can see we list both questions together and then we have our brief answers or brief conclusion. And then we answer one and two. We want our answers to be short, two or three, maybe four sentences. And we want to have a very clear answer. Ideally, yes or no. These are pretty clear though, probably not, most likely, yes. What you don't wanna have is it depends or I can't tell you yet. That's not an answer. Um, so if you need to give yourself a bit of wiggle room, okay, but try to limit yourself as much as possible. And then you're going to explain why the why this answer is true. So the rest of the paragraph is spent defending this answer. And maybe if you're saying probably not, maybe, well, if you say probably not, you, you're, you're somewhat implying it could be yes. So you might want to explain when the answer would be yes. Let me go back to the previous slide for a second. I'm sorry, let's go back farther. Um, so, um, so the questions are the legal issues arising from the facts. So a, a question presented should ideally include a few facts and the legal question. And it should be as straightforward as possible. Questions presented, in my opinion, are the hardest things to write. The second hardest is the brief answers, the brief conclusion. This, a lot of times people think about the brief conclusion as being kind of an executive summary. If you don't have a lot of time to read it, you can read that and you get the gist of it. So now we're ready for the heart, for the core of the legal memo, and that is the discussion section. Um, it's very common to use um, a tool named after, or a little mnemonic, kind of named after the country of Iraq, um, but we pronounce it Iraq, and so it's I-R-A-C. I stands for issue, R stands for rule of law, A stands for application of facts to law, and C stands for conclusion. And you follow this pattern as you go through the, um, the process, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, you should use quotes infrequently. A good rule of thumb is no more than one quote a page, especially if it's a complete sentence quote. If it's a little, you know, four or five words, you might be able to get away with two or three on a page. 
We're not going to talk about proper citation in this class, but just know there is a system kind of like MLA or uh, APA or Turabian that you might use in a different class. Our system is called the Blue Book. Um, and you'll learn more about that in legal research and in legal writing. So this is an example of discussion. Your discussion section should be as long as all the other sections combined, ideally longer than. So, you know, if you, if you look at this, this length plus this length plus this length plus this length plus this length should be no longer than this section. So here you're going to use headings and subheadings. Um, this is something I haven't talked about yet. Headings and subheadings are really important to legal documents. We use them all the time and they help the reader know what's coming next. It helps the reader understand the organization of the document. It also helps the reader sk skim it. They may be skimming it before they read it the first time. They may be reviewing it after they've completely read it. It helps them understand the main arguments and how one item flows into another. Um, it's typical in a legal document to have at least one heading or subheading on every page. I mean, you don't have to. It could happen that there isn't a natural break, but that's how commonly we have headings and subheadings. Again, you'll learn more about that when you get to legal writing. Now, over here in this column, they identify those Iraq things that we were talking about before, but usually they don't actually appear. So, um, pretend, uh, if for, for in the real world, pretend, pretend like these aren't here. These are just, you know, kind of like uh, little hints that they're giving to you. This part is really the material that you're looking for. And these are some examples of blue book forms, the things in italics. Um, and then you can see this is just one page. This, this is just talking, por a portion of talking about the first question, negligent infliction, emotional distress. This probably goes on for maybe 10 pages, maybe longer. So the conclusion, the conclusion is in some sense just a repetition of the brief conclusion, but it should be a bit longer and it should kind of let the reader know, and this is what you should do with what you've learned. They may suggest uh, next steps. It could be research next steps, such as, well, we've researched these two issues, but there's this third issue that we still need to research, and I think we need to research this next. Or it could be, as a result of this uh, research, we think you now ought to file this motion, or you ought to try to settle the case, or you ought to hire this expert, or whatever the next step might be. It's a good idea to recommend an action in this section because the client's going to be paying for this and the client doesn't want to uh, pay several hundreds or thousands of dollars to be told, yep, just, just did this just because uh, nice to know information. Why did I pay $500 for nice to know information? I could have spent that $500 doing something, you know, buying something nice for myself, you know, going out to eat a couple times or three times or something. Um, so you want to um, let the client realize that he or she is getting a good return on the investment. And you can see here in this particular case that it's suggesting an alternative claim that one of the uh, parties can advance, one of our clients can advance. So maybe we should amend the complaint to add this particular claim. So now we're done with our uh, presentation. As always, if you have questions about the material, please don't hesitate to reach out to me either in class or via email or during my office hours. I look forward to hearing from you. Hope you have a great evening. Thanks so much.